pleasure of talking with Harry for the past several months, and it's been such a pleasure. He is so energetic and so enthusiastic, and I know that's going to come through in the program today. But he has an incredible um, story and philosophy, life philosophy, and I know you're going to be encouraged by that. And I'm hoping that he's going to share with you the bike ride um, that it is for his birthday, um, because I was just blown away by um, what he's, he's doing. So, And he's been on several um, television shows. I saw a clip from a morning show in California. He's also been on The Doctors, and if you're familiar with that show, um, he's been interviewed on that show as well. So we're lucky to have him here today. We appreciate his time and his presentation. We are videotaping this presentation. Um, so no hecklers. <laughs> <laughs> no, what was coming out? So no, I broke the video. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to turn you over, and uh, hopefully you'll be encouraged and uh, inspired over the next uh, hour and a half that I introduce to you, Harry Gaines. Thank you very much. Okay, let's see. If, is the sound about right? Does that work for you? Okay, we're doing it because of, with the video, we, I mean, I talk, I can talk real loud, but I'll try to control myself. Okay. This is my book, published in February of 2012. Uh, in the spring of 2010, I happened to meet a guy from a, from a fitness company through my our fitness director at the Brooks and the Commons Club uh, up in Benita Springs. Uh, we had, had lunch. He said, why don't you write some uh, articles for our company blog? I did that. They are awful. They're still on the website. I went back and looked at them. You know, they were the first pass. I hadn't written anything in years. I'm a retired publishing executive, so I used to publish books versus writing them. But I did think a lot about what goes into making a good book. And I hope I put some of those ideas in here. I've worked hard at that for many years. Uh, so he said, why don't you write these articles? And then Kathy, the fitness director, said, why don't you write about some of our members and what they've done to improve their lives, and some of our employees as well. Uh, for our newsletter, and I did that, and I have a woman friend in Connecticut who said over and over and over again, she's known for, for her persistence, write a book. So in May of 2010, I said, why not? Now, this is an important point that I'll make later. I didn't tell people, I think I'll try to write a book. That's not a commitment. I said, I'm writing a book, and someone said, yeah, yeah, you're going to write a book. And I said, I said, I, what, did you hear me? I'm writing a book. I'm going to do it. Now, in writing a book, like anything else, including fitness, there were some barriers that came up, and some of them were pretty big, and I had to overcome them and keep going in the book, and so in 14 months, <clears throat> let me see, it took, 14, it took 14 months to write it, have it ready, and another six or eight to get it published, so 22 months total. Well, an elephant from gestation to birth is 24, so I thought 22 was pretty good. But let me tell you one story about me that I have not told in another... Uh, <clears throat> Talk, but it might it sort of fits the season we're in now. As a young man, I grew up in the state of Georgia primarily. We lived in Miami and Jacksonville a couple of times. And I was in North Georgia when at eight years old I started delivering papers. And I had some kind of ragtag bicycle. And we then relocated to Albany, Georgia, where I was born, South Georgia, uh, when I turned 11 or 12. The bicycle was a wreck, so we got there. My family didn't have a lot of money. That's putting it mildly. And I didn't have any money, <clears throat> and I wanted a bicycle. It was the best way that a young men could make any money back then, it was young men, not women, uh, was delivering papers. I'm sure there was some other alternative. Well, there was a Dairy Queen right near where we lived, a few blocks away, and I used to hang out there. And they had a contest. And the contest was whoever collected the most spoons <clears throat> in some period of time. I have no idea how long it was. You know, to a 12-year-old, a month is a long time. So it might have been six months. Whatever the number of, uh, whoever has the most spoons wins this beautiful swim bicycle. And it was a gorgeous bike. So I started collecting spoons. Now that doesn't mean I just have to eat them. I just look around and pick up spoons when people eat them. I mean, whatever is fair is fair. So I had about 200 spoons. But unfortunately, there was a young kid, I don't know who he was, who had more than I did. So the day before the contest was over, <coughs> A man came up to the manager of the Dairy Queen, who knew me quite well, and said, I've got 150 spoons. Am I going to win anything? He said, no. He said, there are several kids who have more than that. And this is a man, not a kid. So the next question was a life changer. He said, do you know any deserving young man who would benefit from having those spoons? He gave me my name. 
I come home, and I'm going to start crying. It's such a, it's been 60 odd years. Uh, I come home, my mother's crying. She's got 100, and now I have 350 spoons. It's, a, it's all over. <clears throat> it's, it's done. I've got plenty of spoons. So I, we take them over, and I win the bicycle. Well, by doing that, this is hard to read, but that's the, my mother was a pack rat. This is Harry Gaines getting the bike <clears throat> in Derrick King Contest in 19... 52. So that picture is 63 years old. And I'm standing there somewhere. I think, is that me now? I think I'm over here. And I said something like, I think that Derek Queen is super. And I did at the time. But anyway, why is it was important? I started carrying papers. I saved money. I had a bicycle to go to, to a drugstore and work in the summertime. And I could bike home to, there and back. Save money. In the last two years of school, I went to a private uh, school in North Georgia <coughs> called Young Harris. Uh, that had at the time two years of high school and two years of college. And I got away from a, not a really good collection of people I was hanging, young men I was hanging out with in, in Georgia, in Albany, Georgia. <clears throat> Went from there to, to uh, university, Georgia State University in Atlanta. So the bicycle was a life changer. I had the money to be able to afford to go to the school for two years. And I went on to Georgia State. How many of you have had something that happened, a random event, when you look back and you say, wow, that, I went from here to over here, right? It's happened to all of us. Everybody's had those. So I had two more, and I'll make these very brief. A professor in college took an interest in me. He was a very nice guy. He published books with Prentice Hall. <clears throat> he recommended me to Prentice Hall. They hired me, and my whole career was determined by that one man <clears throat> who took an interest in me. Now, he wrote a book in 19, published in 59, <clears throat> called The Magic of Thinking Big, not a textbook. These other books were textbooks. And it's one of those ins inspirational books, a Nolan Napoleon Hill kind of book, or Power of Positive Thinking. It sold over four million copies. And I wish David was alive today. We became very good friends in, for many years. Uh, I wish he were alive today because I used some of the quotes from his uh, book in my book uh, for inspiration. And the last one was... Uh, getting involved in writing this book. That was a life changer. I wouldn't have written the book if I hadn't met that guy on that particular day and if the woman in Connecticut hadn't said, why don't you write a book? And writing a book has gotten me doing things I never would have dreamed of. I got on the doctor's show. The doctor's show was great fun. My son was sitting beside me. We had a wonderful time out there. And <clears throat> the doctor's show led to a feature article in the Philadelphia Inquirer, where I live in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, half the year. And <clears throat> that article, he was on the tipping point as to whether to do it, but I said, well, Art, I'm going to be on the doctor's show. Oh, I didn't. well, now let's get together. And he did a thousand-page article that was very helpful, and that led to a Comcast talent scout contacting me, and we did a taping. A dozen people came to our house in Pennsylvania in September for five hours and taped a show on Comcast with Suzanne Roberts, who is the wife of the founder of Comcast and the mother of the CEO. She still has a show. She's only 91 years old. 91 years old, and she's in my backyard. They wanted to put her on a tandem bicycle with me. That was the plan. I borrowed a tandem, gorgeous bicycle, brand new, white with red lettering, um, 50 miles on the bike. We get to the top of my driveway, and by the way, she didn't walk up the driveway. It's 400 feet uphill. They had the car bring her up. So she's, she's mentally alert, but physically, mm, still uh, not, not, she's not 70 anymore, that's for sure. Anyway, so Suzanne gets to the top. They look at the bike, and they look at me, and they look at her and said, Harry, I don't think this is a good idea. And I said, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> so we used it as a prop. She stood in the back, I stood in the front. It was the opening of the show. But all of these things would not have happened if it hadn't been for that one lunch in the spring of 2010. And those, those events just really get me sometimes. Now. <clears throat> Whatever is next here. Goals. What do we want to do today? We want to, I hope you'll learn something and that you'll walk out of here and say, I didn't know that and that's new information. I hope you'll get some uh, motivation. As <clears throat> Chris said, I do have a lot of enthusiasm and I do get excited and I do enjoy doing this. And I have more fun than you do. And it's just a great kick to do it. And I hope you'll learn and get inspired. I hope you might say, you know, I think here's something I can do that I'm not doing, an action plan. And I hope we'll have some fun. Now, <clears throat> your turn. Why are you here? I'd like several people to tell me why you came today. 
that you can either, someone volunteer, you know what's going to happen. Curiosity. Curiosity. That's a very good reason. Anybody else? Terrific. And good quality of health. Good quality of health. It's huge. That's my next topic, so I'm going to perfect timing. One more. Because I never come to a Hodges class that I don't learn something new. Oh, that's great. That's terrific. I didn't know. Well, I hope that Chris will invite me back. We'll see. He had a, you know who this is. You know, he, he was, did you see his last show? Oh, was that good. You know, what a character. And a couple of weeks later, he's dead. 92 years old. He said, life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. <laughs> and, you know, I love that one. And I thought about it because in the spring of this year, <clears throat> of last year, about April of 2011, uh, or, or, well, actually, no, we're still in 2012, April of 2012, I was cycling with my regular group here in Florida. And in cycling, I get a lot of great ideas, and sometimes I just daydream. But some of those daydreams lead to some great ideas. Because the brain, the, a lot of blood's flowing around, the brain gets a lot of uh, energy up there. And it all of a sudden hit me that in six months I was going to be 75 years old. And the question that came, that what, what I thought about is, how did it happen so quickly? You look around and say, wait a minute. If you said to me, there's an old saying, someone asked, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you are? Well, I'd be 55. So 75 <clears throat> is just, that's a big number. Well, I'm already there and gone. That was in October. So it's a done deal. But <clears throat> what it reminded me of was the importance of what we do today determines how we're going to be doing, what we're going to be doing 10 and 15 years from now. We went to Southeast Asia in October, and there was a doctor and his wife from <clears throat> uh, Connecticut, vascular surgeon. Interesting guy. I had a lot of fun with him. And he made the comment over the course of the trip several times, all of his patients, 100% of his patients in their 90s didn't want to be there. They were done. They, they'd like to just get it over with because they weren't healthy. You know, and they're not leading a good life. It's not, it's not fun anymore. And it would be nice if we could avoid that. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. This one is an interesting quote. I just put this in yesterday. And I, it, it, it struck me because that's Plato. And he was around about 350 B.C. to... I mean, I want to get the numbers right. I, I always revert 424 B.C. to 348 B.C. Yeah, you got to reverse the numbers. And he said, in order for man to succeed in life, <clears throat> God provided him with two means, education and physical activity. Not separately, one for the soul and the other for the body, but for the two together. With these two means, man can achieve, per, can attain perfection. And I thought, that's a great quote. Maybe it's a little bit, I, I use a lot of quotes. I, I, I enjoy them, they motivate me, and I don't, they, they may work for some people. But it's what struck me about it, which it's good content, education and physical activity. Those, by the way, happen to be the two biggies that determine whether you get certain things that we're going to get to in a minute. Education is a big one. So if you want to be sure you avoid some things, go back and get a PhD in mathematics. It'll help a lot, and you'll learn a lot, and you'll, you'll be... You know, move beyond you. And maybe you could skip the exercise if you do a PhD in math. I can't do it myself. There's, there's a guy, um, Richard Feynman, was probably, was one of the two or three smartest men of the 20th century. Feynman did, uh, a couple of people here will know of him. He's one of the more, not only one of the smartest, but one of the most interesting. Uh, he was a Caltech physics professor. He did some of his best work sitting in a topless bar in downtown Pasadena. <clears throat> And he, 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 did, he would, didn't drink alcohol, he'd sit there drinking Cokes and thinking, what am I going to drink, what problem am I working on? He uh, got a Nobel Prize in the 60s for work he did in his mid-20s on quantum electrodynamics. If you'd like to know what that is, there's no problem, just go to Google, because you're not going to learn it from me. But he was a fa fascinating guy. He said when he was dying, he had cancer, he died in 1988, he was about 70 years old. He was in a coma, his family and friends were all around him. And he came out of the coma and he said, I hope I don't die twice. This is boring. <laughs> <laughs> but he had a, a great attitude about life. Uh, <clears throat> this is an interesting guy. What he said was, if you had to pick one thing that comes closest to the fountain of youth, it would have to be exercise. Now, I have no idea where I got that quote. But I, just about a week ago, I said, you know, that's okay. And he is an expert in aging uh, from the medical school at Stanford. 
Uh, he's now retired. So I just Googled him. Today, you know, you can get anything. It's just incredible what you can learn. Well, I found a five-page article about Jim Fries. Uh, turned out Jim Fries went to Stanford undergraduate, ma majored in philosophy. But he was interested in the big issues of philosophy. Why are we here? Where are we going? What do we bring to the party? And as the more he studied, he became an instructor, briefly, in philosophy at Stanford. I don't know if he did a graduate degree in philosophy. It was a little unclear. And the more he looked at what he was interested in, the more he realized that <clears throat> answers to his questions were around the biological sciences, particularly medicine. So he did what any really smart man like that would do. He went to Johns Hopkins, got a degree in medicine, and then did a, an internship in rheumatology, and then he went back to Stanford and joined the faculty and also had his own private practice. And in 1978, Jim Fries <clears throat> had a leave of absence, and he'd been thinking a lot about the health of uh, people and as we age. And at the time, in the 60s and 70s, and I didn't fully realize this, healthy aging was a contradiction in terms. He was, there's no healthy aging, you just age, and you go downhill at a pretty rapid rate. And <clears throat> the concept of morbidity, what does morbidity mean? I, I tell you, I looked it up and I, I had the wrong definition. Jack? Uh, has something to do with death, more is, is uh, lack of Exactly, but it's not death, it's about illness. I mean, you can come up with multiple definitions. Morbid can be someone who's blooming. But it's the morbidity, which is the, the onset of illness. And Jim Fries, in 1978, came up with a concept <clears throat> that was revolutionary at the time. He wrote a seminal paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1980. And it was the concept of compression of morbidity. Now, what would that mean? I'm not going to pick on Jack again. Jack went to Stanford, so he's got a... <laughs> But what would compression of morbidity mean? Think about that for a minute. It's, I'm, I'm going to overuse that term. Making it smaller. Exactly. And his concept was this. Rather than worry about extending the life of people, let's worry about improving the time that they have a healthy life so that you compress the onset of illness, which at that time was about 20 years. Now, that number seemed too big to me, and it may be. I have to do more research on that. But it makes sense when you think about someone who is obese and gets type 2 diabetes in their 50s or 60s. They're not going to die right away. But it's the, the downhill progression at some point accelerates. We have, uh, Bob and I both live in Shadowood in the Bronx. I have friends, I've been there 10 years now, I have friends now who have gone downhill at an increasingly rapid rate in the last few years. More operations. Well, I'm sorry, but Leon can't walk anymore, or Leon's going to have to have back surgery, and maybe he'll be able to walk. I mean, the problems that come up are incredible. So his concept was this. We need to work on the compression of that morbidity so people live a longer, healthier life for a longer time, even if the years don't increase. The years total, I mean, what, 90, 92? Today, everyone in this room is probably going to be the expectancies in the mid-80s. Well, that's fine. And some will make it, 25% will make it into the 90s. And some smaller number uh, may not quite make it to 85. But the, the <clears throat> structure looks like this. The typical lifeline is the black line. <clears throat> so in this case, they're about 80. And what we'd like is to have the line farther out so that when we start, I mean, the ideal would be to just, boom, fall off the edge. One of these days at 93 or 94, it's all over. And that concept, the big number, what do you think of it? There are three factors that Freeze identified as being big ones. Two, one positive and two negative. What do you think the big ones are that determine whether we have uh, a compression of morbidity? Heredity? Nope. That's about 25 or 30%, by the way, of anything. Yes. Uh, number one is exercise. That's the positive. What are the two the two biggest negatives? Obesity, Obesity is number one. Smoking. Exactly. I wouldn't have picked smoking, but it turned out that he's and you know in in my circle I know three smokers out of maybe three hundred friends down here. You know not many smokers. The great news is in the last fifty years that the average the number of smokers as a percentage of population has gone from forty to twenty percent. That's the great news. What's the bad news? Yeah. 
The kids are smoking and are teenagers at a rate of 40%. That's, that's depressing when I think about it. So the big one for us uh, or in this room, in all likelihood, I don't mean, maybe there's a smoker and I don't mean to pick on you, but it is uh, weight control and exercise. So they did what, so it was a revolutionary concept. And so <clears throat> scientists, of course, looked at that and someone said, you know, that may work. And some very important people and heads of a center of longevity somewhere said, let's do some big studies. Well, the kind of studies you need to do here take a lot of time, years. They're called longitudinal studies. The first one was, a was for graduates of the University of Pennsylvania in their late 50s. 1,700 of them followed them for 20 years. Uh, kept detailed records of those people. I want to be sure I get it right. That's why I'm looking at my notes on this one. <clears throat> After adjusting for possible confounding variables, they found that the cumulative lifetime disability was four times greater, four times, in those who smoked, were obese, and did not exercise than it was for those who did not smoke, were lean, and exercised. This is the big one. The onset of measurable disability was postponed by nearly eight years. That's huge. Now it gets better. The next study was with a runner's club somewhere. I don't think they identified where it was. And they took 537 members of the runner's club compared to a control group of 437, 22 years. So these two studies started sometime in the early 1980s. They were just completed in the last decade. <clears throat> The, the difference in this case, but I want to say it properly, that runners developed at a rate of only one-fourth of the control participants and were able to postpone a disability by more than 12 years. Now, the big one, when I read this stuff, and my wife said, don't use the term compression of morbidity. I said, you don't get it. I wouldn't dream of not using it because it gets our attention. It's not something that we hear every day. We say, well, we want to live a longer, more active, healthy life. Well, that's true, we do. That's what we all want. But are we willing to do the things that we need to do to make that happen? Let's talk about brain. That's such a biggie. I have a friend uh, who lives down here. Uh, he used to live in Lighthouse Bay as part of the Brooks. He now lives in the West Bay Club. Uh, Ted, I met in 1974. He was a professor of chemistry at the University of Illinois. Uh, he happened to write for my company, uh, chemistry, general chemistry book, one co-author now is about five, that's been the best-selling general chemistry book for 35 years. It's un unheard of. There are two or three textbooks that have done that well, but that's it. Wonderful guy. And he said one day, he said, Harry, when you write, and he's been a terrific critic for my book in the writing process, when you write this book, you ought to have a chapter on exercise in the brain, which I read one small article about. And he said, I'll put you in touch with the people. And so it turns out the Beckman Institute at the University of Illinois, where he was the founding board member, is a major research center for exercise in the brain. So if you could, if a magic genie came along and said, there's one illness that you can pick, and I'll be sure you don't get it, but only one, what would you pick? Alzheimer's. Okay, the, the three that come up are Alzheimer's, cancer, and heart disease. Okay, since I get to pick, I pick Alzheimer's. And it's a big one for me. Certainly, I think about it. Not, I don't a lot, but I don't want to get it. Uh, what percent of the population over 65 do you think has Alzheimer's? Over 65, not total population. 10. Now you're close. It's about 13 percent. As you can see, there's very little below uh, 75. It really kicks in at 75 to 84. And the 85 plus, um, unfortunately, 47% of the people in that category have uh, Alzheimer's. If you make it past 85, your odds are about 50-50. Now, what are the variables that determine whether you're going to get it or not? Genetic mutation. There is some gene. I don't, don't even need to know what it is. You don't either. 1% of us have it. If we have it, we're going to get Alzheimer's, period. Nothing we can do about it. There's another gene. APOE4. Well, we inherit from our parents, one, uh, both sides, uh, APOE2, 3, or 4. If we get 4, our odds go up. If we get, of getting, if we get 4 from both sides, they go up a little bit more. If our mother and father and brother and sisters 
immediate family have had Alzheimer's, that is, those are also factors. But the big ones that determine whether we get it are these. Physical inactivity, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, obesity. They constitute the great majority. As I said earlier, multiple places, I've been reading a lot of stuff in the last several years, genetics is about 25-30%. Nobody knows exactly, but it's, that's close enough for government work. This guy is a heavyweight also. I haven't done as much research on him, and I'm going to, because he's a, an interesting guy, but it's on the list. Regular exercise is probably the best means we have of presenting, preventing Alzheimer's today. Better than medications, better than intellectual activity, better than supplements and diet. The research I've read, which is a fair amount from the Beckman Institute and other places, the one element that has an impact on, on Alzheimer's and our getting it is exercise. Aerobic exercise is where 90% of the research has been done. There's a little bit of the strength training and that's favorable, but there's not a hell of a lot uh, that's been done there for whatever reason. But aerobic exercise is the big one uh, that kicks in whether we get it or not. Now, even people who have that APOE4, uh, who have a higher chance of getting it, may defer it. They may compress that time by virtue of the exercise that they do. Where do I have to point? I don't know if I have the right button. No. So the big ones that, that we can do are physical activity. Unfortunately, I haven't found any data to back up the impact of social and mental activity on whether or not we get Alzheimer's. People talk about brain games and their computer games, and there's a company, Posit Science, I'm on their email list, I get all kinds of stuff from them. But over and over and over again, I read from scientists in the field that there's no research to back it up. Now having said that, are, are social and mental activity important? Of course they are. They, they determine our sense of well-being, our being part of a community, our, um, our psychological well-being, but they may not get little, they will have little, if any, impact on whether we get Alzheimer's. And healthy eating, of course, is another good thing to do, which I'll talk about. Could, could you go sure. back to that? Um, sure. The second one, physical activity, I understand right. the right-hand side, but the top one, heart, and blood vessel health. What is that about? This, uh, my son did this one, so I'm going to blame him. Uh, uh, and he did, actually, uh, he did. He likes to do things differently instead of just having, and I do too, I don't like bullet points. Uh, it's really heart and blood vessel, blood vessel health is, a fun, is an outgrowth of the aerobics and strength training. Uh, and what I should do, now that you mentioned, is move that down yeah, here. Yeah. And that's exactly what I should do. So thanks, that's a good catch. We don't need a translation for social. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, yeah. Or for healthy eating. Correct. Okay, so what is it? Here's the big one. And it's amazing to me, you know, doctors are, are generally pretty smart guys. Some of them are men and women. Some of them are as smart as they think they are, because many of them have always been very bright and they, you know, they know more than anybody else. And but it's amazing, I've talked to doctors and I'll say, did you realize that um, aerobic activity or exercise activity, I'm gonna focus on aerobics because it's not a lot of strength training data yet. Uh, generates new brain cells? I didn't know that. But it's not that, you know, you say it to a neurologist, he said, well, of course it does. But years ago, not that many years ago, a lot of the research in this area is in the last 15 years. And years ago, the impression people had was that we didn't generate any new brain cells after about age 30 or 40. That it was just downhill from there. But there is substantial data, not only with mice, but also with people, to prove that, uh, that new brain cells are generated by aerobic activity. Anybody know what synaptic plasticity is? I like to throw out big terms. People say, oh, you shouldn't do that. Well, you learn new words. That's how you learn. Synaptic plasticity is the connections because our nerve fibers in our brain and elsewhere are not wired. They're electrical connections. And <clears throat> exercise generates stronger connections, which is improves <clears throat> our ability, and this one should be improved our rate of learning when we have, uh, when we exercise and increase the, the connections of our brain, and it improves our oxygen capacity, our ability to work out at a higher level, and that improves our brain also. And the, the beta amyloid is the bad stuff. People who have Alzheimer's when their autopsy is done after death have a lot of <clears throat> beta amyloid in the hippocampus portion of their brain, which is part related to learning and memory. 
And people who die who are, don't have Alzheimer's don't have very much of that. So <clears throat> reducing that plaque is enormous. This is a story of a high school. And it, it has to be, statistically, there are two people here from Chicago. One. OK. Two. There we go. I just guessed it. Champagne. University of Illinois. Oh, you're OK. Uh, what's the best known uh, good high school in, in the Chicago area? New Trier. You know how big that sucker is? There are 5,000 students there. I was to, uh, some, a guy was cycling this summer, I think, from Chicago. And, you know, 1,200 per, per class. It's enormous. So 97 or 98 percent go to college, have a great record. Sorry, Naperville High School beats them. Naperville, 20 odd years ago, not just the high school, but the school system, got away from athletics as far as physical education and got into aerobic activity. So at least once a week at the high school level, they got to run a mile. Their grade is not determined by their speed, uh, how long it takes them to complete a mile, it's determined by their heart rate. They get a heart rate monitor and they measure it to be sure they're working hard enough and <clears throat> generating the level of activity they should have. So it's really target heart rate. One in 130 of a random sample there a few years ago was obese. The level of obesity in Naperville High School, uh, they did, I won't get it, there's a TIMMS, T-I-M-M-S test, an international worldwide test in science and mathematics. New Trier combined with Evanston, uh, uh, the Evanston High School and a couple of others, three high schools on the North Shore got together and submitted their candidates for this test. Naperville went solo, and they're out west. I know where they are. I used to live in Oak Park, and was, I used to have an office in Naperville. <clears throat> they scored number one, in, and this is in the mid-2000s, uh, number one in mathematics and number six in science for the whole world. They give a lot of credit because the people who exercise, they have a few cases of people who don't exercise as much as they should. They have a number who show up for what's called class zero, 6.30 to 7.30 in the morning, uh, to do aerobic exercise. But there's a direct correlation between the fitness of the students and the quality of their performance in school. Now, I will also say it's a science-oriented, technology-oriented area of um, Chicago. Uh, there are lots of science and technology companies, so they're not the norm population, but it's still the exercise that made a huge difference. Uh, okay, what did he say about success? Somebody ought to remember that quote. What did he say? 80% of success is showing up. Of course, he was never fed, he's not exactly a great human being in my opinion. But uh, he is funny and he's done some great movies, no question about it. <clears throat> in aerobics, uh, we have friends, I have friends, and I'm sure others do too, who go to the fitness center very regularly. They're there for an hour, hour and a half. The problem is they've shown up, but they're not working hard. And it's not enough just to go and, and socialize and get on the machine. I have a couple. Uh, I, I can't ever say it around them. We've got to be careful. He knows everything. He's an investment manager, made a ton of money, and he never seeks advice from anybody at the fitness center, but he gives a lot of advice, most of it wrong. Uh, so I've watched him. His wife, on the other hand, they're from Greenwich, Connecticut. His wife is uh, very fit, into yoga. She gets on an, an exercise machine. She's going like this. I look over at Joe, and he's reading the Wall Street Journal. He's there for plenty of time, but he doesn't work hard. And then he takes 10-pound weights and moves them around a little bit. Sorry, that's not going to cut it. That doesn't get you where you need to go. <clears throat> so showing up, oh, well, i got a point out here. Who came up with aerobics? I thought it was this guy. You know who he is? Kenneth Cooper. I thought it was Kenneth Cooper. I was giving a talk in New York at an investment management firm, the clients there, last week, and a woman said, no, no, you got it wrong. It was Jane Fonda. <laughs> Actually not, of course. Cooper came up with it, but Fonda made the money. These are two examples. The guy on the left, let's make some assumptions about them. The guy on the left uh, is slender, looks good. He's got a dog. He walks the dogs for five or ten minutes uh, every day, twice a day. Uh, the guy on the right, obviously he's overweight. Uh, he does a regular aerobics training four days a week for about a half hour. And he does a little bit of strength training. Who's better off? Who would you rather be? Yes. The one You'd rather be the one on the left? Anybody else? Right. 
Why? It's better to be fit and fat than unfit and slender. And that's it. Now, why do I bother to say this? Because I see people who I think have given up. They don't exercise because they, they have lost weight, put it back on, lost weight, put it back on, and they've given up. Not only have they given up, their body won't go through it again. Uh, who's the most famous one for that? Oh, All the Oprah Winfrey effect. I mean, she has a name for it. When she started out, she weighed 120 pounds. Then she went up to 160. And she celebrated when she got back to 140. And then she went to 200 and accelerated. It was celebration was getting to 160. Well, now she's whatever she is. Her body won't do it anymore. The body says, you're, you're going to starve me again, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to hang on to these fat cells. I'm not going to let you let them go, because I don't know what you're, when you're going to start eating again and putting them back on. Uh, so. <clears throat> It's better to be overweight, work out, do strength training, do aerobics, and have a strong cardiovascular system than to be someone slender who does nothing. That's, an, I think, an important message to get across to some people who have, who have psychologically given up on the idea of working out because they can't lose weight. The fitness industry uses uh, the term FIT, the acronym FIT, for frequency, intensity, and time. And the point of that is you need all three. It's not enough to just do something, five, go for a walk five days a week. Somebody might say to me, I do a two-mile walk, walk five days a week. That's great. How fast do you go? I don't know. Well, why don't you measure it? Because if you're, move, if you're moving at a two, two-and-a-half-mile rate, you're not accomplishing a lot. It's better than sitting at home, but it's not as good as if you really work at a higher level. And I'll get to that in a minute. What's, what's the T part? Time. Uh, time. What does that mean? How long? How, long? Right. how frequently and how long and at what uh, intensity? Got to have all three. Now, actually, you, you don't. You can reduce one and increase another. That's what I'm going to get. That's what I enjoy talking about. So aerobics is working out at a certain level. <clears throat> 60 to 70 percent of maximum heart rate. How do you determine your maximum heart rate? We'll get to that in a minute. I got a little chart for you that might help that you might find useful. Uh, 60 to 70 percent, which gets, you're burning a combination of fat and glucose or glycogen. That's the only picture of me that I'm going to use. A Philadelphia Inquirer photographer, I can't take a picture like that, so I had to use it. Uh, he, uh, what he did was, I have a, live in a neighborhood in, in Pennsylvania that doesn't have any traffic, got a little U Street. So he's, I'm cycling and he's riding and driving his car beside me and shooting the pictures. You know, they could just take a camera and they could, you know, zoom. It's like a um, machine gun, the way they're taking it. And he did a good job on that. So, <clears throat> light exercise is the 60 to 70 percent. Most of us spend most of our time either in, in the first two, 50 to 60, 60 to 70. Moderate is when we get up and we're moving a little harder, and hard is when we can't carry on a conversation. So if we're walking with somebody and we're working at 80 to 90 percent, or particularly at 90 to 100 uh, percent, we cannot talk at that point in time. We're using our oxygen to, to try to breathe and keep going. It's a, working at a higher level of intensity is pretty important, and I'm going to cover that next. But let me cover where the fuel comes from and, and just play, or, or what's the right word I'm trying to use? Uh, dispel. Dispel a myth that I've heard people say. Uh, <clears throat> when you're working at a very low rate, you're burning primarily fat. As you speed up, the amount of the energy comes from carbohydrates or glucose. We get our glucose in from the carbs we eat, and <clears throat> they flow into our bloodstream. And then the harder we work, we start running, we're burning more of this, of the glycogen or glucose, and less of the fat. And as we start, we have a, a, almost an infinite supply of fat, unfortunately but we have a finite supply of glycogen. So when we're working hard, we can't, I can't get on my bike and go at 100% for 20 minutes. I can't do it. The level at which someone can work hard depends upon their physical fitness. So someone who's not been exercising, who decides to work, and by the way, they should get doctor's approval ahead. Um, that disclaimer I forgot to mention. Uh, doesn't have the capacity. They're gonna run out of gas much sooner than someone who's very fit. 
So the thinner you get, the harder you have to work, because the thinner you get, the fewer calories you burn, because your body becomes more efficient, so you've got to do more or at a more intense rate. It's now 10.45, and I, I want to, the, the next topic is one of my favorites. Why don't we take a five minute break? He's going to flip the video, and then we'll, uh, and how long is a five minute break? Five minutes. <laughs> no, you don't. You have other choices. You can do whatever you want. Uh, but the intensity is a big deal. Most people don't work hard enough. They may work long enough. They may go for a two-mile, three-mile walk, four or five days a week. They may do a little bit of strength training. But in, in both the walking and in the strength training, if they work harder, they're going to get a lot more out of it. Not a little bit more, a lot more out of it. So what can you do, uh, for example, in walking? <clears throat> what I recommend, and I have a 80-pound British Golden Retriever puppy, 14 months old, and he is in loaded with energy. So when I take Kip for a walk, what I do is I make a point with Kip that I'm moving like this. Because I want him to move, but also I want to move. If you watch most people walking, this is about two and a half, a little more walk below three. Getting up to four is hard. I've taken my Garmin GPS system and carried it with me. And four and a half, I can't stay there. I mean, just the it's not that the oxygen is just getting in stain. But try this. <clears throat> You're going for a 40-minute walk. Let's just pick 40 minutes as a number. Warm up for five or ten minutes at a three mile an hour pace. Now of course you can figure out how long, what your rate is by just measuring the distance, driving or using some other device. See how far is it and how long does it take you? And you just it's easy to figure out now, what rate do I walk. But instead of walking a steady rate, Walk at whatever your chosen rate is, three, three and a half miles an hour, and then accelerate for a minute. Walk as hard as you can for a minute. And really, it's not a matter of increasing the length so much as the pace. Because I tried both, and with a friend with very long legs, I can't do that. The only way I can catch up with him is by moving faster. But <clears throat> doing that gets your heart rate going. You work at a harder rate. You get up into the 70, 80, 85, 90% range. And you get a lot more out of it. And a couple of other things happen. <coughs> you burn more calories during the exercise, and you also burn more afterwards. What's called basal metabolic rate. So your, re your rate that you burn at rest <coughs> increases. So you're over here, you're going up. And I don't mean do one. Do about five. So one minute up, down, two or three minutes up, down, two or three minutes up, down, and do five over the course of a 40 minute <coughs> walk. I do it in cycling. Less here because I'm riding with a bunch of guys who won't do it, but sometimes I just take off and I go as hard as I can for a minute, <coughs> wait for them to catch up, and a little later I do another one. Uh, but in <coughs> interval training is one of the best ways to get more in less time. If you have less time in a given day, you can't walk for 40 minutes, you only have 20 minutes, do more intervals. Do a longer two-minute interval, and you can get to, you actually can get more done in 20 minutes than in 40 minutes <coughs> under certain conditions that I don't high intensity interval training, which is a little more than I think you want to take on right now. But <coughs> the concept of working harder for specific periods of time, coming back down, and then working hard and coming back down, you'll get an enormous, a lot more out of the exercise. It's a big deal. Any questions on that or comments? Uh, yes. Do you recommend wearing like a heart rate monitor or something? Ah! <laughs> Funny you should ask. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm a big fan of information. I've got records going back for years on cycling. I do a spreadsheet. I get it off of my uh, computer that's in my pocket. And I got all kinds of data, average speed, <clears throat> distance, uh, average heart rate, uh, elevation, climb, all kinds of stuff. So I mean, I love data. So I love a heart rate monitor. Uh, and it provides very useful information. Now, if you want to get a cheap one, you can get one for $32. I bought one for a friend of mine, a guy in his 80s who needed more exercise. And I said, maybe this will motivate you. I'll get it for you. Uh, for about $65, you can get one that will tell you how, long, how much time you spent in various heart rate zones. That is, to me, very helpful. How hard did you work and for how long? And how do you know those zones? Ah, here we go. So, if you go to my website, 
I had, I had a little gimmick my son told me to put on there, which, which I think is a great idea. Uh, fitnessbeyond50.com is a website. There on the, on the front page of that is the heart rate zones calculator. Just click on it. All you have to enter are three things. Male or female, age, and resting heart rate. Now resting heart rate, how do you determine it? If you don't have a heart rate monitor, when you wake up in the morning, <coughs> lie there for a minute, put, get a stopwatch, count to 10 and see how your heart rate is 10 seconds, and then multiply by 6. If you look in my book, one of the dumbest things I put in there said multiply by 10. 10 seconds, 10. And 15 of us have checked it, missed it. It's being corrected. I've got a new printing coming out in a few months. But anyway, age, so you can do an estimate of your resting heart rate. And what this will give you, here's the page. What this will show you is you've got age, gender, resting heart rate, and then it will pump out the numbers for you and show you what your zones when you're working in 60 to 70, 71 to 75, etc. Here's mine. So age 75, unfortunately, uh, but better than being deceased, of course. <laughs> resting heart rate. And these are my zones. Now, actually, this is off a bit. These are, these are done for a, you know, a large population of people. I can get my heart rate. You know the Estero Parkway overpass going? Well, of course, when we cycle, we race over that. And if somebody is really racing with me, I can get up to my max, which is 163. Not for very long, but I can get up there. And so, but these are approximations, and they're close enough. It, it, you don't need exact science on this. So that's my routine on aerobics. <clears throat> High intensity, frequency, intensity, and time. And working harder for periods during aerobic exercise, it is enormously beneficial. And if you want to know more about that, Google uh, in interval training, or sprint interval training, or high intensity interval training. If you Google, you'll get some good information on that, or you can read my book. Yeah? Harry, you talk a lot about the importance of knowing your resting heart rate, knowing your max and all that, and then you encounter somebody like myself who takes these data blockers. That is, I'm glad you brought that up. I totally forgot about that. What, I'll tell you what happens with beta block. What, uh, what is it? Beta blocker, people who have high blood pressure take the medication that brings down the blood pressure. It also bring, brings down their heart rate. So if somebody who's taking a beta blocker, if I were taking a beta blocker and I could, without it, hit 163 going up that overpass, um, I might get to 130. So it slows the heart rate. The problem in intense exercise is <clears throat> that then you're not pumping as much blood. So it's harder to work longer for as, as long, because you're not getting enough blood flowing in the, in the system, and you start getting uh, <clears throat> that burning sensation. Some of our cyclists, the people I ride with here in Pennsylvania, who are on beta blockers, with the approval of their doctor, take it after, but not rather than before exercise. But uh, that has to be checked with the doctor. Uh, but they do have an impact on heart rate, no question about it. Yes? Uh, this this um, refers to what you were talking about before the break. You said that it's better to be overweight and exercise a lot. I know peop most people who are overweight don't want to exercise or they have hip, prob I mean, hip problems and knee problems and there are too much pain to exercise. So I wonder if it's possible to be fit and also very overweight. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Tara Parker Pope writes for the New York Times and she's 60 pounds overweight. She has run a New York marathon, but she can't lose the weight. She's in that position of having been up and down, and her body just won't do anything. It does reach that point, the body won't cooperate, and she exercises regularly. There are people who are overweight, and not obese. I, 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 obese and, I, I don't know, I, I'm not smart enough to figure that one out, but there are people who are overweight, who exercise regularly, uh, who do well are much better off than if they didn't exercise, but you're right, they can get hip uh, joint problems, all kinds of problems, uh, but they, those problems can get better with exercise. Yes? Well, what is the optimal time and frequency? I mean, more or less, what's the ballpark on that? Well, I hesitate, uh, I'll tell you what I think. 
the, the, the data says minimum 30 minutes of aerobic exercise, meaning working at a 60 or percent or higher. 30 minutes, and if you do that, that, and there's also some data to back up that I'm not a big fan of, just personally, and I'm not a doctor, so please, but I've done a lot of reading, and I really enjoy it, that says, you know, the more you do, the, the benefit doesn't increase this rate, it sort of levels off, and that's probably true. Um, I do 10 hours a week. Now, why 10 hours? Well, we do a 40-mile bike ride three times a week, and that's two hours and 15 or 20 minutes of cycling. So we're up to seven hours, and I do strength training and, and stretching. I don't count golf as exercise, except in Pennsylvania when I walk and carry my bag. So 30, if you do 30 minutes, that doesn't mean begin walking at a slow pace and count that. Warm up 30 minutes in an aerobic zone uh, per day, you're in pretty good shape. I'm a big fan of strength training. I'll get to that in just a minute as to why. And I, don't, I doubt that 1% of the people in this room do enough strength training. And it's so important. And there's a big reasons for it. So you're going to hear my enthusiasm about that. And that takes more time. I'm at an hour five days a week. Or six. Five hours a week. If you do five hours a week of exercise, you're in pretty good shape. And you're way ahead of the curve. Because only 10% of those over 65 even say they do any strength training. And most of them don't do enough of it. Don't work very hard. So strength training. <clears throat> You know, I love this question. And what's, which way is more, a pound of muscle or a pound of fat? Pound of muscle. Pound of muscle. You know, some people ask that question, they'll say, oh, the muscle is heavier than fat. Well, that's true. That's not the question. <laughs> what is the question? Yes. It's a pound. Well, muscle pound is a pound. Can't hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just telling you a pound is a pound no matter what. A pound is a pound. A pound, which way is more, a pound of feathers or a pound of steel? That's the, it's a, it's a trick question. It's kind of a smart ass thing, but yes. Uh, muscle weighs more than fat, but right. it's denser. Fat, you can It weigh, takes up less space. Like some people can say, wow, I, I weighed 125 pounds when I was 17. Now I'm 80 and I still weigh 125 and I don't look the same. It's because fat is that's there right. instead well, of the muscle. Well, the muscle goes, uh, unfortunately, if, uh, there's, in Woodbrook, uh, that's kind of right up there. But people who have more muscle, this, the point of this was kind of nicer than about those of you who regular strength training, <clears throat> they burn more, the basal metabolic rate is higher because muscle burns more uh, calories than fat. <coughs> That's the key point of this. So 300 a day is an approximation. You know, when we throw around calorie numbers all the time, all of them are approximation. And someone said, well, you need 2,500 calories a day. Well, you may need 2,200 or 2,800. But none of this, and even the calorie counts. The idea there are four grams, four, uh, what was the, what's my point? Grams to calories, uh, four per uh, gram of protein and carbohydrates and nine for fat. Those are approximate numbers. It really is probably 4.352, but nobody's going to put down something like that. So we're working with averages. Here's what happens, what you're talking about, the muscle mass. As we age, beginning at about age 40, we lose about 8 to 10% of muscle mass per, year, per decade. And it begins to add up to a pretty big number over time. That's why the, the, the weight may be the same, but the disposition of the body is very different. Here's an example of that. This muscle right here, which is in the front of the, of the quadricep. It's a big muscle, it's got a lot of nerve fiber, the muscle fibers in there. Here's what happens for people who do not do regular exercise. So the muscle fibers go from 800,000 <clears> at age 20 down to 250,000 or so at age 60. It's you know, just over time. Elite athletes, that doesn't happen. Now, an elite athlete who, let's say, just to make up a number, could bench press 275 pounds at 20 years old. Can't do that at age 60. But he can do a hell of a lot more than somebody who's not done anything. And the, the decrease is, is there, but not even remotely close to this. So strength training, to me, is a very, very big deal. How many, I think it was on the, <clears throat> what's the, what's the word osteoporosis? What does that mean? Everybody knows that. 
Van, van az. Vagy osteokinia. The bone loss junior. It's uh, starting to happen, but hasn't kicked in yet. What is sarcopenia? That's a tougher one. That's, that's the one that I'm focused on right now. That's death. That's death. Loss of muscle mass. So the 8 to 10 percent per year, we don't do anything about it. We're still going to have loss. We can't, we can't eliminate it, but we sure as hell can slow it down. There are 90-year-old men who have doubled their leg strength, leg strength in three months with regular uh, uh, strength training. So not only if we're down, we can't add any more new muscle cells, but we can make the ones we have stronger. So the formula, <clears throat> and it's a big deal to warm up for strength training, because if you, and it's a big deal to build up gradually to strength training. Not go in and say, all right, now I'm going to do what Harry recommended tomorrow morning. Huh? No. It takes time. Using proper form. Who does a better job on strength training with form, men or women? Huh? <laughs> women. women by far. I don't think it's even a contest. You go to, if you watch people in a fitness center, you know the, the, the woman has been over doing it just right at the right speed. Actually, you know, if I were lifting the weight right now this way, I get more out of this going down than I do going up. But I should take twice as long to go down as up. So the concentric and eccentric, and don't have to forget which one is which, but the one going down is has more benefit to the muscle than the one going up. So proper form is a big deal, and men need to work harder at that than women. Women, by the way, don't work as hard. Men, more men work harder in strength training than women. Begin with light weight if you don't do strength training now. <clears throat> now, there are three words. One is fatigue. There are three words that are used in the industry to talk about strength training. One is to exhaustion. I don't like that word. The other one's worse, to failure. <laughs> and the third one is to fatigue. But what does it mean? It simply means doing a, a, a weight until you can't do another one using proper form. So if I were doing a bicep curl until I cannot maintain the form and bring that last one up. Now, does anybody know why this is so important? Other than the doctor in the room? <laughs> you don't know. Yes. Well, if you start using poor form, you uh, you you know compromise your joints. That's that. Yeah, but I, and that is a, that's a good point, by the way. I was focused on too fatigue. You know why it's important to work out to the point that you can't do anymore? Because if you that's can't right, do it yes. anymore, okay. No, not lactic. Uh, that I mean, and lactic acid buildup is okay. It didn't do any harm. You're going to hurt it. Not, it. It goes away over time. It's a, it's a big deal. Because, and look, because you push to the maximum? That's correct. But what, what, and here's what happens. I'm not trying to play games with you, but I like to find out what people know. The, <clears throat> the process of working to, you can't do another one, breaks down the muscle cells. It actually damages them, but I hate to use that word because people think that's a bad thing. Why do you prune a tree in the fall for the spring? And what happens to the, to the I mean, bush? When it comes back, it comes back stronger in the spring. What it does is break down the muscle cells and they grow back stronger. They don't grow back stronger in two hours. So strength training, particularly serious strength training, shouldn't be no more than two or three days a week. I do two. Only because I only have two days available, I might otherwise have to do three. But I, I do want to still play a little bit of golf. I do that a couple of times. And I cycle three and that leaves two days for strength training. Uh, but <clears throat> the process of breaking down the cells we're not going to grow new muscle cells. That's kind of important. Again, 60, 70 years only can happen. But the ones we have can be one hell of a lot stronger. I can work out with weights today that are only slightly below what I worked out with 15 years ago. Now, if I'm away for a month, about three weeks in Southeast Asia, come back, I drop down. So if I were doing a weight with 45 pounds, I'd go down to 40. And then if I stick with it for three or four months, I may get back up to 50 where I was five years ago. And I can, but I do it slowly. I don't want to, and by the way, it doesn't have to be, I could do the same thing with lighter weights, but more repetitions. Somebody brought that up a few months ago, and I said, no, I think it's better, because young people do heavy weights, fewer reps. That's macho. Let me show you what I can do. I can take this and move it. It's a big thing with men, not with women. <coughs> So you look, I like to do 12 to 15 reps, two sets. 
<clears throat> three sets is fine, fewer reps, but three sets, is, that's okay too. But if, if you wanted to work with lighter weights and do more reps, it's, the point is getting to the point of fatigue, where you can't do another one. It does, in fact, there some research I read said it was better to do lighter weights, more reps, than heavier weights, fewer reps. But the difference is marginal. So it really is a personal issue of what you're more comfortable with. But I can't overemphasize the real value of really working out to that level of activity. But building up to it over time, and ideally with a, a personal trainer once a month. Yes? Um, what about wrist weights or ankle weights? Do you like those or not? Um, I'll tell you what, I, I don't uh, evaluate individual exercises. Uh, there's nothing wrong with those. If you were if you were walking and putting ankle weights on to increase your make it a little harder, or uh, a friend of mine told me about a belt you can wear around the waist that adds another 10, 15, 20, 30 pounds, whatever you want, to make it harder, so you got to work harder. So I don't have a, I don't have a, a valid, informed opinion about those. Two to three times per week. So here's what happens. That's a relaxed muscle, and that's a contracted one. And this one, when it gets contracted, uh, gets damaged. I don't I can't think of a better word than damage, but it's uh, it's a, a stress on the muscles sort of grow back strong. So here's what can happen. And this is from a Mayo Clinic clinic book. So I tend to think that they really know what they're talking about. Ten to twenty-five percent in twelve weeks. I have spent two to three times a week building up to fatigue. 50% or more gain in six months. It is amazing what you can gain from strength training. You know this guy. Somebody does. Yeah, Rory is a, he's a kick. You know? It's amazing that there are two or three, I think it's three golfers from this little tiny part of the world who are in the top. Uh, Graham McDowell was number one in the world, and then Rory comes after him. Just from a little, I've been there. It's not very big at all. So what Rory said, I have to look at my notes on this one. I haven't memorized this one quite yet. Is he, uh, Rory weighs now 170 pounds. Uh, about a year ago, he weighed 160. So what he did was, he put on 10 pounds of muscle, but not really. He put on 20 pounds of muscle because he started doing regular strength training, working hard. And he put on 20 pounds of muscle and took away 10 pounds of fat. And his trainer said, Rory's never lacked for confidence, but there's a lot of scientific evidence that links being strong, physically fit, with self-confidence and psychological well-being. And those are great things to have on the course. And he's absolutely right. The people who work out to do aerobics and do real strength training, that feeling of accomplishment, it, it does several things, and I'm probably going to repeat it in a minute. It builds what I, a, a term a doctor used here a few years ago that for some reason I didn't know, self-efficacy. You know what that means? Somebody does. The confidence that you can do something. The reason I didn't say, I think I'm going to write a book, is because I know when I say I'm going to do something, I do it. Because I say it loud enough, often enough, to enough people that I damn well better because they're sure going to let me know if I don't. But and I'm serious, that's, and I'll probably repeat that in a minute. But his, he does 90 minutes, five days a week. <clears throat> we remember him. What did he say about um, insanity? Somebody remembers that. Yeah, so in strength training particularly, and in aerobics, varying the routine, our body gets used to doing something a certain way. And we get, it becomes more efficient, and therefore we're not stressing as much, and therefore we don't get as much out of it. Um, I have a trainer, uh, and bicep curls, I use them as an example because it's easy to do up here. That's not one of the more important exercises. It's nice to have big biceps, but not one of the critical muscles. But she has about five different ways for me to do bicep curls that varies the routine. One is I sit on a ball and hold a foot up, and I do it this way. Another time I'm doing this and curling. But all of it keeps me from doing this, which you see people doing in the gym. They're moving. I, that's not proper form. But varying the, the, the other piece of that is the, the nerve fibers get fired. <clears throat> and if you're firing different work, they have to learn different techniques. They're not getting locked into the same thing all the time. Core exercises, as part of the strength training program, uh, is an enormous yes. Question on, uh, on before we go strength, strength training. Uh, 
our fitness center, like many of them, have both uh, pre, pre weights and also machines. And it, it's sort of my impression that the machines are better designed to isolate a particular mu muscle. Like, for, exa for example, the bicep curls that I can isolate that, and I can't do what you were just demonstrating. Right. Is that, is that that's generally true? Uh, I'll tell you my preference, and I think there's some data to back it up, is the difference the machines do some of the work for you in terms of providing that support. <clears throat> Doing it on your own with free weights, you've got a balance more. It's proprioception. You fire, so if I'm doing this, my brain is awake. You've got to get the leg is up, and we've got to move these muscles. So we're activating more uh, <clears throat> cells. We're improving. That's why balance is such a big deal. When, as we get older, you know, we can do this, but what if I close my eyes right now? I can't do that because I don't practice that enough. If I did, well, maybe I can, but not for very long. So doing balance and core exercises around here, and a good personal trainer can come up with easy, or you can, if, if you don't know something, Google it, core exercises. Mayo Clinic is a great source <clears throat> for all kinds of exercise. They have videos, they'll have step-by-step -step instructions, um, I've used them for but there are lots of sources. <clears throat> you know, I used to think I couldn't go on for 90 minutes. Now we got 15 left and I got an hour's left of <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <clears throat> Let me cover this quick because it's, there, there's, actually I think I'm going to uh, skip ahead a bit. Because it really is some stuff I want to spend more time on. This is about a guy in our community. And it's about overcoming the limitation. I want to cover some food, and I want to cover motivation, which I used to have at the beginning, but I put at the end because let's talk about what you need to do and then why you need to get motivated. And the healthy eating, in the last 30 years, here's what's happened to our food supply. This is the calories available per capita from 1980 to 2000 or something. <clears throat> has increased from 3,200 calories per person per day to 3,900. The food supply has gone up. We don't eat 3,200 or 3,900, either one, because that includes waste. But the point is, if you work with the macro number, our food supply has gone up. In direct proportion to that, obesity has gone up. In boost, obesity has increased 50% in the last 20, I think it's 30 years or 20 years. <coughs> Uh, and it's related to food supply, because what happens when the supply is greater? What are some of the ramifications of that? Huh? Prices go down. Uh, restaurants serve bigger portions. Some of the portions we get today in some restaurants, as you know, are enormous. And some people, unfortunately, choose to eat all of them. So prices go down. Uh, the, the, the quantity of food goes up, and if we don't watch it, we'll be eating a lot more. Uh, there's a, a point on calories. People say, well, what about carbs and protein and, uh, and fat? You know, all, you know, proportion is a, a, important. We don't want to focus on eating all the wrong stuff. But you could lose weight on a diet of Twinkies if they were still in business. Uh, <coughs> Twinkies, a guy did. Yeah, he lost 28 pounds in, I don't know, six or eight weeks. Because he ate 800, 800 calories of Twinkies per day and a few other crap foods. Nothing of any, no, he didn't feel very good, but he lost weight. So it, it, <clears throat> the input is the issue. How many calories per day and how many are burned? So if you exercise more, you burn more calories. Why is it that uh, an exercise physiologist last spring at, was talking, the University of Miami was talking in our fitness center, and he said, you can't lose weight by exercise. Why? I don't agree with him, but that doesn't matter. He knows more than I do. No, maybe not. <laughs> no, that's, that's, a, that's a good... You don't, well, actually, that's true. As you, you, could, you could stay the same and have, and have looser pants <clears throat> by virtue of having more muscle and losing fat. Um, and there's another reason, though. As we, we exercise more, we tend to eat a little more. We're hungry. And by the way, we really have to eat in order to exercise. So when, you know, in order to diet, I'm getting to that topic in a minute called Lopa, which is a big deal and I want to get to. So the only way <clears throat> to really lose weight is, well, a variety of ways, but the way that makes the most sense is to reduce the caloric input to some amount 
and increase the burning of calories by doing some exercise and reducing the input uh, over a regular period of time. I, I, you, you, I don't have to tell you how I feel about diets. You know, we don't have to go into that. It's just, you know how many people lose weight on a diet and put it right back on uh, in a relatively short period of time. I don't know, I'm amazed how quickly they can do it. The other thing that screws us up as we get older <clears throat> is our basal metabolic rate goes to hell. Not by all that much, but for men, I thought <clears throat> women had more than um, men, but I was wrong. So women lose about 10%, men 17%. So what that means if we, at, at 30 years old, we're burning X number of calories, and at 50 we're burning Y number of calories, um, we, it's a smaller number, and we're going to gain 1 to 2 pounds a year if we don't do anything about it. Continue with the same input, the output's not the same, <clears throat> and we, that's, if you look at a lot of people you know, it's not they put on 50 pounds in two years, it's a couple of pounds, three pounds, five pounds, and then all of a sudden it's a big number. The bigger the body, the more calories they burn, you know that. So it's one to three pounds per year if you don't do anything about it. So active adults, <clears throat> and this is a big generalization, I may even stop using this, but it's about how many calories we burn. But again, it's an approximation. I did say, I was telling Bob, I was at a talk last week, and I said at some point about calories, and you really can't count them down to the next half. They're not that exact. And uh, my hosts were walking out following two of their clients, two women who were talking, and said, you know, it was a good talk, I enjoyed it. What do you mean by those that Nat's hats? They were a kick. And the, the, the most burned in daily, I think, is a Tour de France cyclist. You know, three weeks they're doing 81. They, they, it's hard for them to eat enough to compensate to keep their energy level up. The bad stuff is the visceral fat, <clears throat> which is around the middle, what's here called intra-abdominal fat. We have visceral fat and subcutaneous. Subcutaneous is right under here. And we've got subcutaneous fat all over our body. But if we have, if someone has a big belly and primarily around here is where the fat is, that's the stuff that gets into trouble. Diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, all kinds of problems. Now, <clears throat> how many calories in a medium order of uh, McDonald's french fries? What would you think? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> No, actually, it's not. I thought it was worse. What do you think? Is it uh, 350 or something? You're, yeah, 370, 350, it's in that range. About 45% of it is fat. Well, <clears throat> in February of 2011, I decided to give up French fries. And the first person I told, of course, was my wife. And she said, I don't want you to do that. Why? You know why. <laughs> no, 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 I wasn't. No, there was another reason. Well, actually, well, she never ordered them. She just ate some of mine. <laughs> she, wanted to eat. she didn't want to get a big order, but she wanted four or five of mine. So I don't want you to do that. So, well, I'm going to do it. Uh -huh. And I did what I always do. And I knew this idea intuitively many decades ago when I quit smoking. And we may or may not get to that when I've got it on here. But I gave up French fries, and that was in February of 2011. And in January, I had an assessment as part of a program that Bob and I belonged to at our fitness center. And I had another one in, then in January 2012. And in that span of time, <clears throat> uh, controlled experiment, same people, same guy did it. I, I lost eight pounds, and the big one was I went from 19 to 16 percent percent body fat. That's huge, three, per, three percentage points. And somebody that was giving a talk said, how did you eat? Yeah, how much did you eat? Well, not near enough to <clears throat> lose eight pounds in that amount. Well, here's what happened. The act of giving up the french fries made me more aware of other things I was eating. I gave up potato chips recently, not in the eight pounds. But I decided, you know, they have no redeeming value. There's no nutritional value. Why don't I replace the potato chips with something else? And I did. And the french fries, by the way, I missed it for two or three weeks, and that was it. That's the end of that. No a lot easier than giving up smoking. But uh, <clears throat> I became more aware. I don't, what goes well with french fries? Hamburger, right? Hamburger and french fries. Well, no, and I sort of gave up hamburgers. I might have one every six months, but I stopped being, uh, reduced significantly the input of red meat, <laughs> reduced the input of some other fried foods like potato chips, 
and started leaving more food on the plate when I go out to eat. So all of those little changes can make a huge difference over time. Not immediately, but over time. And I'm a big fan of little changes here and there. <clears throat> a big problem, as you know, is sugar. How much sugar do we consume per capita? I'm counting high fructose corn syrup and pure sugar. Well, what do you think? Per person, United States, 156 pounds. Now, a Food and Drug Administration said 78 recently, but I don't think they counted the corn syrup. And the articles I read, everyone would say that's not a real number. But it's something over 100 and up to as much as 156. Is that a year? In a year. The high fructose corn syrup is the one we want to watch out for. And, not, and be aware if we can. It, it requires reading some labels. Well, it gets, it's kind of fun. You learn a lot. Uh, it's metabolized like alcohol, and I'm a big fan of wine, so I'm not suggesting you give up alcohol. You can do it if you want, but it's not on my list. It's metabolized in directly the level, whereas the regular sugar <coughs> goes through the pancreas and bloodstream a different way. So there's, it's not as good for you. You know, you look at all the things that we do have that aren't all that good for us, and of course there's a long list of them, but you've got to pick your poison. If nobody, a friend of mine in New York, with the host of the investment unit, I had dinner with her, she went to her trainer at her gym a few years ago and she said, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to look at, here's what my, my body type I want to be, and here's the training, I want my muscles to be able to do this, and he said, can, she said, can you do that for me? He said, sure I can, but you'll be miserable, because <laughs> you'll have to give up everything, and I don't think you want to do that. So why don't you set a more reasonable goal and you like to drink wine, right? Yeah, okay, well, you have to give up wine if you want to accomplish what you just said. So I think we all pick our, I, I'd rather drink wine than eat french fries. You might say, well, I don't care for wine, but I want something else. Yes? Oh. I um, thought you were. Oh, yes. Um, one effective way of keeping weight down or losing is to not eat anything white. No white, white. bread, You're no absolutely. potatoes, no rice, You're no absolutely sugar. Right. We, and there's a very easy way to eliminate eating the food most of the time. What is that? Shut very easy. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. <laughs> if we don't have it, I mean, I bought, I love frozen yogurt. My wife doesn't want to eat very much of it because she puts on weight more rapidly than I do because I exercise more than she does. And so I remember I, I was going away, but I bought two half gallons of frozen yogurt. Pretty healthy stuff, is you know, no. Maybe a stretch, but it's not all that bad. And I came home, they were gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if I buy something she doesn't like, she throws it away. She likes it, that's the problem. She doesn't want it in the house. So we don't, you're right, we don't have white bread, white rice, any of that in the house. And I don't, if I can get brown rice instead of anywhere, it's, it's much, much better. Here's an exercise. I know it'll scare you a little bit, but I, you know, maybe I shouldn't leave it up too long. Uh, but I, this took about an hour. I decided to figure out what do I eat on a regular basis. So my breakfast and lunch are pretty well set. If I'm eating at home, that's what I have for lunch. <clears throat> if I'm eating out, I'll have, uh, after playing golf, I'll have a bowl of soup or something else, but it's pretty healthy. This was a year ago when I was eating potato chips. Uh, and these are a range of options for I wouldn't drink 10 ounces of wine and gin and tonic and all that in the same day, or eat all of those snacks. And then the dinner is varied. So I eat about 2,000 calories in breakfast, lunch, and dinner daily. And I also have about 500 calories in some energy drinks and energy food I'll eat when I'm exercising hard. So 2,500, 2,800 calories, somewhere in that range on a daily basis. Well, it's comforting to know, and then it's also interesting to to analyze the, uh, <clears throat> what, look at the amount of sugar. But the issue here is most of that is pure sugar from fruit. It's burned at a slow rate. You don't get this energy rush high and then it crash down. So it's, it's reasonably healthy and a lot more sugar in breakfast than any other meal. And I've made some minor modifications here, not enough to make any uh, significant difference. But writing down what you eat for at least a brief period of time to see what the consumption is, is really an interesting exercise. And it's not all that hard. And there are several choice places. Nutritiondataself.com was 
is the one I like the most. Uh, Mayo Clinic, which, well, Calorie King, I thought, kind of was pretty good too. All three of those are good choices. The uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture has a website with this stuff on it, but boy, is it complicated. Way too much. Uh, I don't want to jump ahead because I'm talking longer than because I've got, I've got to tell this story. Absolutely, and I've got to cover a couple of other things. Terry Anderson on the left, this is a better picture of Sally. Terry Anderson and Sally McGuire. Terry Anderson and I worked together 30 years ago in Annapolis, Maryland. He now lives in San Rafael, California, which is in Marin County, north of San Francisco. And we've remained friends. When I go see my son in the city of San Francisco, we always go for a bike ride with Terry. And he's a very strong cyclist. His wife used to ride their tandem with him, but she got tired of cycling. So <clears throat> she gave it up. And he was looking for a partner. So he connected with Sally to ride the tandem. He got bored just riding a solo bike. And, Tal and Sally was a pretty good athlete, but she hadn't been into cycling. She wanted to get into it. Well, Sally doesn't have a car. So Sally and her dog, on Saturday mornings from January until uh, May, every Saturday would take three buses, two transfers from east from the Oakland <coughs> on the East Bay into the city, north 20 miles up to San Rafael. Terry would pick them up. Her dog would play with his dog, and they'd go out for a training ride of two to six hours. Because Sally said pretty early on, I'd like to do a 100-mile ride, what's called the center. So they trained for the 100-mile ride. Early in the training, uh, about a month into it, she had an injury unrelated to cycling, ended up in the hospital for a week. So no training, no opportunity to exercise. But she overcame that. She, by the way, she does spin training at her Y and yoga five days a week. So she didn't rely on just one bike ride to build up with it. So they did the 100-mile ride in a very respectable time, 16 miles an hour. Terry's really strong. And she's pretty strong, too, and got strong. Uh, and they did complete it in May of uh, this year. There are a few things I didn't tell you about Seth. She's been type 1 diabetic since she was 8 years old. She's been legally blind since age 3. The dog, is, as you can see him right there, is her CNI dog. That's why she doesn't have a car. Uh, so she's married, <clears throat> she goes to concerts, works in the garden, goes to plays. She's a recovering alcoholic and drug addict, so she uh, does counseling for AA in her time. She leads a very full life. So when I think about uh, working less, giving up, I think about her. People like that, they're incredible. And she's, she has, Terry said, I've never met her. I'm going to meet her sometime when I'm out there. She has a smile like that on her face all the, all the time. That's my favorite. Uh, what do you want to do? I can uh, go another five minutes. I'm running over, and I apologize for that. I'm getting a better sense of how, Chris, yes. I talk too much. <laughs> so here, let me cover these, and then I'm going to wrap up. What they did and what we need to do are set goals. We need to write them down. Why is it, I went to a sales training conference one time and a woman spoke and she said, 95% of salespeople hate to make cold calls and the other 5% lie about it. Why is it we don't want to write down our goals? We can't, we don't make it. Fear of failure. It makes them real. It makes them, <laughs> then we got a commitment. I'm going to lose it. What I said, we're going to lose 10 pounds, but I didn't tell you about it. If I don't lose it, it's no problem. We used to say if it gets measured, it gets done. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's, I like that. I'll use that. We need to have people around us who help us achieve what we People who, are, who live healthy generally hang around people who live healthy. There's some exceptions to that. But, uh, and we need support. And, uh, and the support group can be small, it can be large, it can vary a lot. We need to overcome because we have periods when we don't get it done. And it's as a friend in upstate New York said, we need to start over and over and over and over again. And he sends me emails when he starts over, when he used to be a great athlete, but he does a lot of other things. So we set short-term and long-term goals. Uh, short-term can be X amount of weight to be lost in, in the next two or three months, a reasonable number. Long-term, I'll tell my story that Chris wanted me to tell, which I haven't told. Uh, I want to do 90 at 90. And you say, well, what is that? Well, when I turned 70, I said to my son, who's also a cyclist, I said, uh, 
why don't we start doing a, a birthday ride every year? We ride my age. He said, sure. So he and Terry Anderson fly out from San Francisco to Bucks County, and occasionally have, uh, we've done it in San Francisco. We primarily do it in Bucks County, which is hilly country. It's a, uh, the ride's about 4,000 feet of elevation. Um, so at 70, at 70, we did it, and we did it at 71 and 72. And it was a big event this uh, year at 75, and we had people from all over the country who came. We had eight of us who did it. Everyone finished, it was a good ride. And my son travels a lot. He's a training and development consultant. He works a lot with Apple and Google, and he's going to be sitting all over the world. So and he doesn't get to train as much as he'd like. So he was struggling for the last 10 or 15 months. And he said, Dad, <clears throat> when you turn 90, why don't we convert it to a kilometer? <laughs> <laughs> I said, actually, that's a very good idea. And, now, here's the point. It doesn't matter. Having the goal is a big deal, and running my life in the way that will be able to potentially achieve that goal is a big deal. <clears throat> actually, doing the 90 miles at 90 is not the big deal. It would be nice, uh, but kilometers would be just fine with me. And we need, as we, Bob said, you've got to measure it. It's got to be achievable, and we ought to celebrate success other than uh, go out and get, drink too much and eat too much. Um, I think I'm going to stop. I've covered <clears throat> a lot, and we could go on for quite a while, and I'm almost done. So uh, this one is not important, and I want to skip to this last one. Who is he? Somebody John, have John, John Wood. He died at 99 years old. He's one of the more interesting people I've ever read about. I've read two of his books and uh, another book about him. Uh, he was the basketball coach at UCLA. <clears throat> He won uh, 10 national championships in 12 years, 82 games in a row, finally the University of Connecticut women beat him. But he had a, a quote, huh? Yeah, he did. Huh? I thought it was Connecticut. No, no, he's talking about No, basketball. basketball. Consecutive no, games. Consecutive games. What? No. Okay, well, we'll, yeah, we'll Google it in a minute, but I'm pretty sure it was Connecticut. Uh, but his uh, definition of success is a peace of mind which is a direct result of making the effort, and he always put the emphasis in effort, to be the best we're capable of becoming. He would rather see a, one of his teams <clears throat> play their best and lose than not play their best and win. And he really meant it. I doubt any other coach in the world when he's that. So it's making the effort to be the best we're able to become. That's it. Thank you. You've got a great audience. <laughs> if you're interested in my, my book, I have it up here, 15 bucks, cash or check. Up to you, and I'll first will sign it. It's up to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Let me